and welcome to the Creators Assemble YouTube page. Thank you for being here and we are super excited today. I'm Moni Barrett, co-founder of Creators Assemble, but more importantly, we have Jana Morishima, who is a literary agent and she specializes in children's and YA graphic novels and visual storytellers. How are you doing today? I'm awesome. Thank you. Enjoying the cool weather there? Yes, we were just chatting. It's 32 degrees. Woohoo. Oh, that is, that is, we're having rain in Southern California right now. And it's like, what's well, that's happening? Good. That's really good. We never have that, but it's maybe 50. And I'm like, it's too cold. I got to put five sweaters on. Yeah. <laughs> so we have some great questions for you today. And they were actually collected on Discord of all places by creators. So these are actual questions. And oh my goodness, aspiring creators are the most amazing people to just put questions out into the world and they will give you their feedback. So within 10 minutes, we had 10 really good questions for you. So um, are you ready for me to dive into the first one? Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. Okay, so number one is what do you look for in a client and what do you do for your clients? Okay, those are two really big different questions. Yes. <laughs> what, what do I look for in a client? Um, number one, I would say is an emotional connection with the work. So mm -hmm. I have to feel it in some way. Um, and it's really hard to articulate. Uh, I think I represent a fairly wide range of styles and genres, um, age levels, everything um but yeah i i have to feel like i'm feeling something from the work so i i look for that i also look for marketability because it is important i'm i mean an agent is fundamentally a salesperson mm -hmm. so essentially i have to know that i can be able, i i am going to be able to sell the work in the market um the other thing i look for is originality combined with an understanding of the market so it's kind of interesting i feel like you have to kind of know the field that you're working in um but you also have to be original in some way so it can't, you can't be derivative or sort of copying what's already out there so those are the general things that i'm looking for okay. um i'm not looking for any specific genre at all does that so answer you, the question yeah no that so you must have kind of like a sixth sense almost of and experience you know the combination of the two to kind of look at someone and, and be able to say, yeah, I can sell this. Yeah, I feel this and this yeah. could work. Well, I don't, I don't, the sixth sense is not quite how I would put it. Because honestly, one thing I want to say is it's really subjective. So mm -hmm. I might, I might resonate with something and then another agent, just it's not their cup of tea. Um, but that doesn't mean that it isn't marketable. It just means that maybe I'm the right person for it and another person isn't. And then vice versa. Sometimes sure. I can, I look at work and I think, you know, this person is really, really talented, but it's just not the kind of thing that I'm super excited about. And mm -hmm. because I need to go out there and represent this person and be really passionate about it and convince other people that, that this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, um, I have to believe in it 100% myself. It has to be something that I really love. Um, so sometimes it's, it's hard for me when I give a rejection to people who I think are really good and I know it's just because it's just not my thing. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the message I want to put out there. This is such a subjective business. And just because one agent isn't right for you or one editor or one publisher, that doesn't mean that there isn't somebody else out there who's perfect for you. I like that. That's a nice positive message. And then what do you do for, for your, your people? Oh, what do I do? Um, a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so the first thing that I do is coaching i would say i think part of what an agent does is really <clears throat> me, keeping um a creator moving like keeping the momentum going with their creative work a little bit of being a psychologist or dealing with mindset um and then the editorial and creative development so helping them uh reading manuscripts giving comments on paneling thumbnails any aspect really of the storytelling and then um, putting together, helping put together proposals and pitches for publishers and then going out and submitting to publishers. So part of that is also relationships. 
Um, a lot of what an agent does is building relationships with all different people in the industry, especially editors, obviously, and art directors. Um, then also contract negotiation. So uh, negotiating with editors on their, what, so when you get a, um, an offer from a publisher, it's usually a two-step process. So first they're gonna send you what's called the deal memo, which would be the basic terms of the agreement, like the advance and the royalties and sub rights. Um, what, I can talk about that a little more in detail if you want. Um, so so you, you go back and forth with the editor to finalize the deal terms. And then the second step is the contract. The contract has everything, all the legal details. And sometimes it can be like 25 or 26 pages long. And that's a whole separate negotiation, the contract. You, what The terms that you agree to in the deal terms, the major terms, those are in the contract. And once you've agreed to that with the editor, you can't change those things. Okay. But little things in the contract you can change. So the, and then selling sub rights. So selling um, subsidiary rights to international publishers for foreign translations, sell, selling film and TV rights, selling uh, merchandising rights. Those are all subsidiary rights that are related to the original IP, the original intellectual property, which is your graphic novel. So those are most of the things. <laughs> That's really great. And it's just because knowing a lot of creators, obviously what they want to be doing is focusing on that creation and having that relationship with someone like you to kind of help fully flesh that out and then not have to worry about, you know, the legal end of things and the negotiation, not kind of, not kind of stressing over that. You sound like you're an amazing advocate for your clients. Yeah. The other thing I should mention is um, marketing and career strategy. So that's another part of what I do is trying to help people look at the big picture and figure out where their strengths are and what their goals are and uh, giving them feedback that helps them get to where they want to go. That is something that we all need, but <laughs> we all <laughs> yeah. need to. <laughs> yeah. Where do you find most of your clients currently? Are is it people coming to you or, yeah, yeah. Okay, like so the, where I find most of my clients, honestly, the majority is word of mouth referrals. Yeah. So somebody that I'm working with is like, oh, you should check out my friend's work or, oh my God, I read this webcomic. It's amazing. Um, so it's people that I trust that I already have a working relationship gotcha. with. Uh, then I, I have gotten a few clients through the community that I started, Kids Comics Unite, which is a great because it's a place where I get to talk to all different creators all the time. Um, so that's another way that I've gotten clients. And I've even gotten a couple clients from the course that I'm going to be launching that we're going to talk about later. Um, so yeah, so those are the three main methods. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that, that that's the value of networking. We tell creators mm -hmm. that too all the time is it's just like, again, they want to be focused on their work, but the network, you know, who you know, and that kind of oh, thing. Oh yeah. Very, very important. Community is so let's see, when it comes to marketing your books to the general public, what kinds of things do people like to see? And this person put poster, post, posters, cards, et cetera. Uh, when it comes to marketing your book, okay. Uh, the, what would, the printed materials like cards and posters and stuff like that mm -hmm. is something I think is not, not the first thing I would think about when it comes okay. to marketing. <laughs> sure. the, first, the first thing I would think about is um, marketing your book is a really long-term process. It's sort of like some, it's a marathon that never ends. You're always marketing your book, basically. Um, so start by, um, you should ha have a website and probably some sort of social media presence. You definitely don't need to be everywhere. You could pick one platform as a place where you just post regularly. Um, and I also really recommend to people that they have a mailing list um, and for sending emails. I know a lot of creators feel like they don't have time for it or it's a gigantic pain in the butt, but I am a real fan of that because on a social media platform, you don't own the relationship with your fans. And the, the social media platform has an algorithm that it uses to determine who sees your messages. And so practically never is everybody gonna see 
any anything that you're putting out there. It's always going to be a small percentage of the overall people who follow you on your social media mm-hmm. site. Mm-hmm. So that's why email is so great because if you send an email, you know it's at least getting through to everybody's email inbox. Maybe they're not always opening it, but at least you know you have the ability to reach them. So I always say, just put a little little um, sign up for my newsletter thing on your website at minimum. That way, at least you know that when people come and they really like your work and maybe they'll sign up, then you have their, you're not gonna lose them. So that's sort of the foundation. Um, and then it's just a matter of um, knowing your audience. So being really clear, you're, you're not talking to everybody, you're talking to a, the type of people who are fans of the type of work that you do and just slowly developing a relationship with those people. And if you start with a tiny handful, maybe you have a newsletter list of 10 people or you just um, reach out to your friends and family and let them know what you're doing and they follow you on Twitter or on Instagram or something like that. And then you you just be consistent about putting little um, pieces of information out into the world about what you're working on behind the scenes or whatever is fun for you. Think about, think to yourself about um, conversations that you've had with people you like where you got so excited and you just couldn't stop talking. What is that stuff that you love to talk about? Then that's what you should be putting out into the world. I love that. The passion that people will respond to. That's great advice. So again, these are first person from Real Creators. How do I enter into the industry as a writer without going broke, paying a bunch of artists, to draw my pitch slash comic slash graphic novel. This uh, question actually prompted a lot of discussion because it was like, well, obviously, you know, illustrators deserve to get paid. Of course they do, but how do you enter in as a writer without uh, really overdoing it in the beginning? Well, writers, I will agree, they have a little bit more of an uphill mountain to climb in the world of comics and graphic novels. Not, of course, in the world of book publishing, Sure. So one thing I would say is if you're specifically interested in kids graphic novels or YA graphic novels, you could consider writing prose first and getting better known that way and then going into graphic novels because that would be easier if you start building. Yeah. And in the world of picture books or illustrated chapter books or even what could be called a hybrid a book like an illustrated chapter book that has some comic element, you don't need to find an artist. You just submit your manuscript to a publisher and if they like it, they're gonna match you with an artist. So you don't need to pay anything up front. Um, so that's one approach to that problem. If you're dead set on comics and graphic novels, you wanna be a writer in that field and you don't wanna do picture books, you don't wanna do chapter books, then like I said in the beginning, you're just setting yourself a little bit more of a challenging path. Um, what I would say in that case is building relationships again, going back to community, being part of the comics community, and hopefully finding an artist that you're really copacetic with and just forming a team and really working together on your project and submitting it as a team. That's what I would say. I love it. Back to the networking again. Mm-hmm. So is it better financially to self-publish or to go with a publisher if that's possible? I personally am a fan of self-publishing, which is kind of funny because I'm an agent, which means I work in the traditional publishing I, world. That is not the answer I thought you were going to give. Yeah. 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 But I, I think self-publishing is awesome if you are willing to invest the time and energy to do it right. I think in order to be successful with self-publishing, you have to have a, an entrepreneurial mindset. You have to really be willing to take on the business and marketing side of publishing. Mm-hmm. If you can do that successfully, you do have a potential for earning more money. And you also put yourself in a really strong position if you do eventually want to be traditionally published. Because if you already built your own audience, and um, you have the numbers to prove it, that puts you, you have a lot more leverage when you're dealing with a traditional publisher. So that's the reason why I think self-publishing can be awesome, but it's a lot of work. And like I said, you do have to have a business mindset or you have to have 
a spouse or a partner or best friend or somebody who's going to kind of handle the business part of it for you or with you. Um, traditional publishing is has a lot more prestige. So, yeah. it, you know, that matters to a lot of people. And so that's why I think a lot of people want to be traditionally published. So it all makes sense to me, but um, it's, it's just, it's harder to break into traditional publishing. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't exactly have an answer on whether it's not that one is better than the other financially. It's all, it's all dependent on you as a creator. Just weighing the options, which is, mm -hmm. is good to have. It's so cool to have the self publishing. Oh yeah, we live in a world that's so different than what existed 10 or, yes. 10 or 30 years ago. Creators have so much more power in their hands right now. Mm -hmm. They just have to step up and, you know, use it and be strategic and think long term. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember being a librarian in the beginning 20 years ago when I had friends coming out of college, like, I'm going to self-publish. And I was like, oh, they're never going to, you know, do anything with that, you know? Yeah. And, and now my mindset has had to change as I've gotten to know these amazing creators and, and self-published can, can be better stories often too. Yeah. There's so. amazing stuff that's being self-published. Yeah. For the longest time, one of the best selling series that was on Amazon's children's graphic novel list was self-published. What, what? Like top, top 20 best selling on Amazon for kids graphic novels, which is an extremely competitive category. Yes. Kid, the kids graphic novels. Yeah. So world. whatever I'm, I'm, that person was raking it in. <laughs> oh, like, That's okay. awesome. Yeah. Cause <laughs> yeah. there's no, there's no middleman there. Yes, exactly. There is no middleman. Yeah. Interesting. Very cool. Um, so we talked about social media platforms a little bit. Um, and it sounds like you're probably going to have one, but if you could choose one, uh, which one or, or a fundraising platform or what do you, how do you feel about that? is the best way to kind of get yourself out there and, and support it, hopefully. I don't think that there's one social media platform that's better than others. It's, again, it all comes back to you and where you feel comfortable and what feels right to you. I know some people love Twitter and some people prefer Instagram. And I, I really honestly don't think one is better than the other. What's more important is that you pick a place where you're going to put your work out there publicly and do it consistently. That's what's important. Yeah. And, and, and with um, fundraising platforms, same thing. Nice. Okay. So have you seen any change in the types of projects you are getting pitched now because of COVID or your projects that you're mm -hmm. seeing now because of COVID? Yeah, I was thinking about that. Not, not really. I did have a project that was directly related to COVID, which obviously I wouldn't have had um, if that hadn't, if COVID hadn't happened. But other than that, I wouldn't say not. I'm not seeing anything differently. Have you seen more or fewer projects? This is a question that I'm curious about, just in terms of people being stuck inside, perhaps not having the same regular job routine anymore. Are you seeing more projects, like an uptick? Um, no, not necessarily, but you know, what's really funny is I started my agency in January of last year. So I started mm -hmm. it two and a half months, like before the lockdown. <laughs> That's right. So we I, had that I conversation. Have, I don't have enough time really to have seen what the world was like before COVID. So totally. Yeah. No, actually you and I had that conversation when we first met because we both yeah. started in yeah. the time of COVID and it's going to be interesting yeah. to see how things look afterward. Okay. Yeah. So we'll have to revisit that question when this is all over yes, um, yes, to yes. see what, what the output is for people's projects. Yeah. So is there, do you have any examples? You obviously don't have to name names, but where you met a creator and you knew automatically, and you kind of talked about this in the beginning, what makes you want to rep somebody? Did you, did you meet anyone and you were just like, yes, I have to represent this person? For sure. Yeah. If I see somebody's work and I'm, I, love it instantly I mean I see a lot of people who are represented by other agents and I'm like, I wish they were my clients because I love their work so much yes. yeah so yeah definitely all the time I mean I just that's the fun part of being in this business is just all the amazing talented people kind of see where you click and then what are some well, you kind of covered this a little bit but common traits maybe if you could give like 
one word, you know, maybe three traits that uh, makes you see as someone being successful as a new talent when you meet them? Uh, persistent, <laughs> big one. Um, originality, I would say. Um, and having a healthy mindset, I guess. I think believing in yourself, believing in yourself. That's really important actually, I would say. I think especially in a space we're talked about where there's so many great people out there yeah. and, and you're going to get rejected here or there. Uh, yeah, rejection is a huge part of this business and it's very tough. So I think um, working on your mental state is actually really important. Yeah, if, you're, if you really want to make a living in, in the creative field. To kind of know that the rejection is not a rejection of you, but just yeah, this wasn't yeah. the right fit at the right time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You just have to keep going, keep working, keep improving your craft, um, making connections with people, just step after step after step. I remember I went to an SCBWI conference at the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Um, and the keynote talk was given by an illustrator named Brian Collier who is really, really well known and he's won tons of awards. And um, he talked about how he brought his portfolio around to publishers. This was back in the day when people actually brought their physical portfolio to publishing yeah. offices in New York City. Um, and he said he did it for seven years before he got his first book contract. Wow. That's, That's yeah. persistence. Yeah, but I, I've heard many, many stories like that. It is not uncommon to have to work at this stuff for years before you eventually get a book contract, you know, and break into the big leagues. <laughs> Paying your dues, I suppose, yes, right? Yes, yes. So you have a fantastic sounding class, and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute, but I just want to make sure, is there anything else that you would like to mention related to what we've talked about? Um. Not, no, I think all, they were actually really good questions. Yeah, you sent them to me ahead of time. And when I looked at them, I was like, these, these are great questions. So creators are just amazing people, as we've said over and over again, right? Yeah. So you have a class coming up next week and we will try to get this video out quite in advance. Well, now a week in advance of that, at least so people can hear about it. But we've been posting it on our social medias. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your class? Yeah, so I'm teaching a master class um it's called how to build a successful career as a creator most uh, most of my work is in the children's and young adult space so that's most of the examples i'll be giving in the class are related to that although honestly the principles that i'll be talking about are basically applicable to whether you're doing adult graphic novels or kids graphic novels or even prose books or picture books um, so basically what the class is about is just some fundamental principles um, to set the foundation for you to succeed as a creator. And the reason I'm doing this free masterclass series is because I'm launching a course in February called Kids Comics Intensive, which is a 13 week intense course. I, it's called an intensive for a reason. Um, we have, I teach weekly lessons and I have a co-teacher. Um, we have homework every week. We have office hour every week. And the goal is to take you from the beginning of the course and have you in a completely different place at the end. By the end of the 13 weeks, you'll have made a lot of progress on your main creative work. You'll have made progress on your website. You'll have made progress in terms of understanding your ideal readers and how you want to be reaching them. So that's, that's what we do in that 13 week course. And the reason why I do the master class is because I feel like you need to see what I'm like as a teacher and experience it in order to decide like I'm really willing to invest the time and energy in this long, much longer course. So yeah. that's what, that's why I'm doing that. You're giving away a really helpful sample of, of exactly. the overall. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those, that all sounds great though. So um, Jana Morishima, thank you for being here with us today. And you can find information about the class. Oh yeah, at it's on should I, it's yeah, uh, janaco.co slash masterclass. 
And we'll have it on here as well. And then you can find her, uh, I guess it's your network, right? At Kids yes. Comics Unite. Yes, yes. Um, KidsComicsUnite.com is, is a private mighty network, which is sort of like a Facebook group. It's like a private hosted Facebook group, um, but it's free. So if you just go to that site, you register and then um, you'll be admitted and then you'll be in the Facebook it's not a Facebook group. It's like a Facebook group, but it's, it's a community basically for kids comics creators. Very cool. I'm sure it's super supportive and it's good networking, like we keep saying. So yeah, yeah. It's really fun. It's really, really, really fun. All right. Awesome. Thank you for being here today. This was wonderful. I'm sure that they're going to get so much out of, you know, seeing this and we'll get it posted, posted to creators assemble dot org and also to our web our youtube page i'll put it on the discord so that uh okay. the folks that actually ask the questions will get to see the answers from you i'm sure you'll you'll hear a little something from that but thank yeah. you again yeah it, so you're putting it on youtube yeah if, Is that if okay? people yeah sure if people leave comments i can try to answer comments so if you have if you have Ooh. questions follow-up questions then just put it in the comments Oh, awesome. That's so generous of you. Okay, you heard it. So comment on the YouTube page, which is uh, the Creators Assemble YouTube channel. We just had hit 100 subscribers yesterday, so we can actually oh, have yeah. a custom link. Yes. I was like, please help us not have this big, giant, gross link. Now we can live stream and do a few That's other awesome. cool things. So yeah, big milestone yesterday. Um, so thank you again, and we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Thanks.